All right. Hello. Welcome to another talk on critical perspectives on technology. So my name is Katha Spiel, and I'm an Hertha Firmberg, FWF Hertha Firmberg postdoctoral scholar at Theorin. And there I research marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. My pronouns are they, them, and my sign name is. Uh, this lecture series is part of my research project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies and in interaction design, and supported by the human computer interaction group at TV. Uh, at the beginning, I kind of want to ask people what you need to let me know. You can either um, tell me in the chat one-on-one um, -on -one or just generally. There are a few things we have provided. One of them is uh, automated subtitling. Uh, it is doing a fairly okay job. Um, we also have uh, sign language interpretation in Austrian sign language. And for that, you should look for this name. It's um, UGS Dolmetschung. Um, I've put it in the chat just for those of you who might want to have the sign language interpretation but are not necessarily familiar um, with the Austrian part of it. Um, another thing is that we do have access copies for you uh, or that Laura so, was so kind to provide them for you. I am going to drop a link in the chat as well. Oh, or Laura just did. And um, the, uh, there's just the request that you should only use them for this lecture and not to distribute them. And that's just out of respect for the speaker. And also that way um, she can share with us all the new and exciting things that she maybe hasn't shared before yet. <laughs> Anyway, yes, you are here today to hear from Laura and not from me. Uh, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction though. So, Laura Forlano is a Fulbright award-winning and National Science Foundation funded scholar. And she's a writer, social scientist and design researcher. She's an associate professor of design at the Institute of Design, where she is director of the Critical Futures Lab. Forlano's research is focused on the aesthetics and politics at the intersection between design and emerging technologies. She's an editor of three books, Bauhaus Futures at the MIT Press 2019, Digital STS, from Princeton University Press 2019, and from Social Butterfly to Engaged Citizen, also at MIT Press 2011. And she received her PhD in communications from Columbia University. Her presentation is titled Designs Intimacies. And you can ask questions during and after the presentation in the chat window or however Laura tells you to. Afterwards, we will all be in a discussion led by Irene Posch. Who is a researcher and artist with a background in media and computer science. Her work explores the integration of technological development into the fields of art and crafts and vice versa, and social, cultural, technical, and aesthetic implications thereof. She is also a professor of design and technology at the University of Art and Design, Linz. But for now, Laura, take it away. Okay. Thank you so much, Kata, and it's wonderful to be here uh, with you all today. I'm calling in from the ancest ancestral homelands of the Lenape people. So I go by she, her pronouns. I identify as white, 
middle class, highly educated, living with a disability, privileged Italian American. I think I'm human, but I also write from the perspective of the disabled cyborg. And you'll hear more about that today. And I work at the Institute of Design. Um, you may know the Institute of Design as the new Bauhaus School. It was founded in 1937 by Laszlo Maholi Naj. And it was dedicated to studying the aesthetics of mass production and technology for the benefit of improving human life. So my work is interdisciplinary, it's multiscalar, it's multimodal, and I consider it to be very experimental and part of the inventive turn in the social sciences, we might say. So how do we design in the face of immense technological and planetary uncertainty? When there's no turning back and there are no guarantees, everything must be re redesigned, starting with ourselves. So I call this the no normal. Um, riffing on Arundhati Roy's uh, article from last year's Financial Times, where she says, nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. So these are the three books that I edited as Kata introduced. Um, and in the recent book, Bauhaus Futures, we asked the question, what would keep the Bauhaus up at night if it was practicing today? Um, and what we had in mind there was really, you know, what would be the new materials of design and what would experimental individuals do um, today with the kinds of design questions that we're facing. So now I'm going to read you just briefly from um, the beginning of the book project that I'm currently working on, which, which um, is called Automated a memoir for design otherwise. So this is not a research project that I chose, but rather one that landed on me in 2011 when I learned that I was type one diabetic. It's a roundabout, a detour, a change of plans, but at the same time, one that has quite literally shaped who I have become over the past 10 years. The kinds of research questions, theoretical frameworks, methodologies and projects that I've pursued as well as what I'm able to do and aspire to do in the future. I've been living with a smart medical device, an insulin pump and sensor system since January 2018. The system helps regulate and control my blood sugar, allowing me to stay healthy, do my job as a professor, go running more easily, and maybe even someday drive a car again without the fear of frequent, persistent, and sometimes frightening lows. But these health benefits have come with a substantial cost, one that's had a negative impact on my overall well being. Let me backtrack for a moment to the year 2013 before I adopted an insulin pump and sensor system. At the time, I often woke up in the night, drenched in sweat, and nearly too weak to get out of bed to get a 15 ounce glass of orange juice from the refrigerator in the kitchen a few steps away or even to reach for chalky glucose tablets sitting on the nightstand. I was living alone with my partner in another city, and so I often went to sleep hoping that I would wake up in the morning and not fall into a diabetic coma. While teaching my classes, my face would go numb. While walking down the street, I would suddenly not be able to feel my legs. While the fear of severe lows is a thing of the past in my case, in the past two years, due to the need to calibrate the sensor system in order to ensure its continued operation and accuracy, I've not been able to sleep through the night more than a few times a week. It's almost ironic that the system that nearly eliminated the frequent episodes of extreme low blood sugar that woke me in the middle of the night almost a decade ago has enforced another form of sleep interruption and deprivation but this one feeds data to the algorithm rather than sugar to the body. With the current smart system, frequent sleep interruption is such a common occurrence 
that it be become convinced that it becomes sleeping like a sensor in shorter patterns that mimic the system and even developed a fear of sleeping due to the knowledge that I'll likely be awoken a few hours later. As a writer and researcher, I've described the ways in which my experience of post-human subjectivity as a disabled cyborg takes on new dimensions as algorithmic agency plays out under my skin as intimate infrastructures that guide my internal processes. In short, with long-term sleep deprivation leading to anxiety, irritability, and depression, I've come to believe that the AI system that is keeping me alive is also ruining my life. Okay. So with that, um, I'm going to move back to um, talking about sort of the overview for, um, for this work. Um, so one of the um, you know, conclusions that you could say of my experience is that sensors and humans make very bad uh, bedfellows indeed. Um, and so with that, I'll move to some of the research questions and broader framework around this work. So the research questions um, are around human technology relations, um, how we might become accustomed to living with algorithms and AI systems in everyday life, and what are their agencies, temporalities, materialities. In what ways are both humans and technologies disabled with reference to themes such as maintenance, repair, and breakdown, um, as well as failure and care? And what are the politics of these algorithmic actors in everyday life? So I've written um, about the idea of decentering the human and the role of theories of the post-human, and you know, went very broad to a wide range of, of theoretical perspectives, uh, including actor network theory, feminist new materialism, OOO, non-representational geography, and transhumanism in some of those early pieces. Um, but now I want to offer a word of caution. And as I've gotten more interested in research around, uh, for example, critical disability studies, and critical race theory, um, I've, I've started to think more about notions of radical humanism as well. And this might be represented by, by some of these books um, here. Um, and I'll just read to you one um, quote from the book you can see there, Zakia Iman Jackson's Becoming Human. And she writes, in complementary but highly distinct ways, these literary visual texts articulate being human in a manner that neither relies on animal objection nor reestablishes liberal humanism as the authority on being human. Instead, they creatively respond to the animalization of black and being by generating a critical praxis of being, paradigms of relationality and epistemologies that alternatively expose, alter, or reject not only the racialization of the human animal distinction found in Western science and philosophy, but also challenge the epistemic and material terms under which the specter of animal life acquires its authority. What emerges from this questioning is an unruly sense of being, knowing, feeling existence, one that necessarily disrupts the foundation of the current hegemonic mode of the human. So, I mean, I think the point here is that um, that there, there is an interest in unsettling or perhaps destabilizing liberal humanism, but that these works are coming from a different um, perspective and we might capture that around what might be referred to as a radical humanism um, rather than say the, a post-human um, or uh, transhuman or, or some of these other um, theoretical orientations. So if we think about um, the more than human, which may capture both 
the post-human and radical humanism and sort of these, these debates, which are quite diverse and widespread, um, we might think about a shift from experiment to experimental, optimization to imagination, prediction to possibility, persuasion to speculation, control to indeterminacy, perfection to fissure, universal to differences, solutions to questions, exploitation to symbiosis, transmissions to translation, and nodes to relation. Um, and it's just a way of capturing, you know, many of the interesting developments that are going on in a wide range of fields that, you know, argue for alternative modes of thinking and being and doing. So what are some of these new materials if we start to think about the more than human um, that we might draw on for inspiration? And I really hope that this talk can um, connect with some of the experimental work that you all are doing and thinking about the, the self, um, theory, AI and nature and uncertainty themselves as new materials. And so I'll just give you a brief idea of what that means. Um, so the self as a design material is something, of course, I'm thinking about with this project, what types of uh, auto ethnographic futuring or design I might do with this project. Um, theory as a design material, I think, is, um, you know, documented through works that talk about practice based research, but still there could be much greater engagement with concepts and ideas specifically from um, the social sciences, but as well as, um, as I mentioned, critical disability studies, critical race theory, um, as materials for our design process. So rather than relying pre predominantly on, for example, um, primary research or interviews with users, so to speak, we might actually um, read uh, critical disability studies or other theoretical bodies to gain insight into um, you know, those lives. Um, and I think we could do a lot more with secondary research as, as a, a material. Um, this idea, of course, once, once you think about your own self and sort of the role of theory in your work, um, what's been really inspiring to me is to engage more with the ideas of Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire, just through understanding this idea of praxis that, that you know, theory can be found in everyday life. And that every day, you know, there shouldn't be this strict separation between, you know, objective science and, um, you know, living, uh, you know, living and making and doing as a design researcher. That that these things um, are are quite uh, entangled and interrelated. Um, so AI as a design material, I mentioned. So there are, you know, books going back, books and articles going back over years talking about. You know what kinds of things we might do if we thought about AI as a design material. Um, also, we might think about the natural world. So I, I mentioned Anne Galloway's More Than Human Lab here, where she studies and, and is engaged with living and dying with sheep on her small farm. Um, another project is uh, Spenya Kuna's Textile Farming. Um, in which she builds a prototype uh, in which to live and kind of grows her own uh, curtains and things from living materials. Um, and we might think about uncertainty as a design material. And this is an argument that's made in the futures field often um, with some of this, these recent books that you know, we can learn to design with uncertainty. Um, and but I think engaging with feminist futures as presented in some of these works is also um, quite interesting. And in particular, um, thinking about you know, notions of design justice and what it means to design also with um, people with disabilities or disabled people, um, and to think about your own positionality, which I think is a big part of the feminist um, orientation here. So this idea of, of CRIP, um, I'll mention, I know that the, one of the last seminars um, as part of this series was engaging with these questions. So, you know, thinking about 
the word crip and sort of how it's been, um, you know, taken, you know, first as a negative, but uh, or a slang, but then sort of appropriated by uh, disability studies as a positive, um, and this idea of, of crip futures. So uh, some of these recent books um, are really engaged with telling the stories of uh, people with uh, disabilities and sort of what it means to design with them um, and, and what those first person stories uh, really tell us about the world. And I would argue um, drawing on a conversation that I had with Kalem Miele uh, in science and technology studies, but also uh, engaging with Alison Kafer's book, um, Feminist Queer Crip, uh, that disability is about anticipation. You must constantly be negotiating and planning your next move. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, I calibrated my sensor in the middle of the day and the pump suggested that I administer more insulin because my blood sugar was a bit high. But I was about to take a 20 minute walk, which would cause my blood sugar to become too low. So in this case, the human is a better judge and no amount of data about context will ever satisfy the machine. Um, so, you know, everyone wants to be a cyborg, I think was pointed out also in, in um, the last talk you had. Um, but no one wants to be a monster and experiencing one's own body as monstrous and foreign at the same time, uh, over time becoming more comfortable with machines and the ways in which they interface with the body. Um, one of the reasons that I started this project was actually because I kept getting stuck on the knobs of kitchen counters. So I'd be having my morning coffee, looking out the window, um, and I would move, turn around to grab the coffee pot and realize that I was actually, my tubes were tangled up with the, the kitchen counter knobs. So that, you know, led me to kind of a funny joke about human and non-human entanglement, which we hear about so often um, in, you know, in Karen Barad's work and other uh, scholars. Um, and this is a artwork by Lee Bull, a Korean um, multimedia uh, artist and sculptor. So here, just to, to kind of refresh for anyone who didn't, um, wasn't here for the last session in your series, um, Jillian Weissa talked about this idea of triborg, sort of how everyone wants to be a cyborg. Um, and Ashley Shu talked about this notion of techno-ableism, the ways in which technologies are marketed to kind of solve these problems um, that people have. And Liz Jackson's concept of the disability dongle, which she says is a well-intended elegant yet useless solution to a problem we never knew we had. Um, so um, Riva Lair in her Golem Girl memoir says that fear of monsters and disabled people stems from the idea that they are contagious. Monsters violate boundaries by biting or oozing or infecting their way past the wall of the self. Um, and of course, ultimately in her book, she you know, reclaims that that notion of the monster in a, in a more positive way, in the same way that um, the term crip has been appropriated. Um, here, there's the Crip Techno Science Manifesto, which uh, talks about the centering of disabled people as no earth and makers, um, the commitment to access as friction, uh, for example, protest or refusal or non-use, for example, um, also, crypt techno science is committed to interdependence as a political technology, and it's committed to disability justice. So, you know, while it's very common to use memoir or first person narratives or autoethnography or soma design or design biography, especially when writing about um, gender race and disability, um, what does that really, what does that really mean? And you know, how might we seek uh, inspiration from those forms? Um, this recent book by Laurent Fournier talks about auto theory as a feminist praxis. And she writes that works that exceed existing genre categories and disciplinary bounds and flourish in liminal spaces between categories 
they reveal the entanglement of research and creation and that few seemingly disparate modes to fresh effects. Um, and some of the books that have, I think, done this recently, uh, we might consider uh, Tressie McMillan Cottom's Thick, Elizabeth Chin's My Life with Things, Mackenzie Work's Reverse Cowgirl, and Lachlan Jane's Malignant as examples of a kind of auto theory, auto ethnographic account of their own experiences. So some of the things that taking an auto, auto ethnographic approach allows is this collapse of the boundary between who is researched and who is the researcher. Um, also a deeply personal significance in finding out the answers to your research questions. Um, it, the work tends to be very performative and resonates strongly with audiences and scholars and designers. Of course, you also may potentially make an impact on something that will change your own life. Um, and uh, there's an ability to extend theories from the social sciences and humanities into design practice. And I mentioned that um, it tends to be very performative. So the storytelling in this mode of autoethnographic work is expressive, theatrical, personal, intimate, vulnerable, cautious, uh, comfortable, and sometimes awkward. Um, so now I'll return back to the topic, um, the post-human subjectivity and network medical devices sort of empirical case and tell you a little bit more about that experience and sort of how, um, how I make sense of it. So, so what kind of evidence am I using um, to document this work? Um, well, I, I write short autoethnographic vignettes. Um, they might be a half a page, and those become examples in the text or writing um, that I can then analyze. Um, of course, drawing on my own experience, but I also use machine data, and in particular, the alert and alarm data, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, also images of the devices, systems, and interfaces, sort of time diaries about when and where something, uh, an event or something might happen, uh, customer service calls, doctor's appointments, participation in uh, type one diabetic communities, and then also secondary literature. So for me, this concept of intimate infrastructures becomes relevant for this project. And I define that as a way in which the body expands out into the world and the world collapses onto the body. So for example, a continuous glucose monitor takes uh, blood sugar and sends that data to loved ones um, so that they can make sure that you're having a good day, for example. Um, but also the, the networks of supply chains that are required in order to get all of the, the pieces and parts that one needs in order to keep the system going. So for example, in late uh, 2018, when I ordered this device, there was a hurricane in Puerto Rico and it caused delays. And so I wasn't able to get the sensors in time. And I hadn't really ever thought about the relationship between you know, supply chains and medical devices and all of the things that were needed and climate change. And so that was, a really, you know, for me as a disabled person hearing that a climate disruption could perhaps prevent me from getting the, the supplies that I need to stay alive. Um, so I, in that sense, I think about them as these uh, infrastructures. And I've written a little bit about this experience in an article called The Danger of Intimate Algorithms on Public Books, which you can read um, a fairly short article, but now I'll show you, you know, sort of more of the data than I was able to include in that piece. Um, so the types of parts and pieces and sort of relations that are involved, you know, include everything from test strips and needles, and insulin vials and pens, um, blood tests, doctor's visits, glucose tablets, AAA batteries, um, sensors, receivers and transmitters, which I spend most of my time, you know, talking about today. Um, alcohol swabs, and of course, more doctor's visits. Um, and here's an image of the device. This is the world's first hybrid closed loop system as it is marketed, um, the Minimed 670G. And it has a couple of different features that you know, I can tell you about. 
Um, so basically, unlike the previous insulin pumps, which were more like a linear system, which had preset times of day uh, in which insulin was delivered in specified amounts, this system has three options. So it can be manual mode, which is like the previous linear system. It can be hybrid mode, which would suspend on low, which means that it gets data from the sensor and then decides if it needs to suspend in order to prevent low blood sugar. And auto mode, um, which is the AI system, uh, you know, where the user trains that system with data um, for approximately you know, one month. And it's intended to function more dynamically. So similar to a natural human pancreas. Um, and in order to do that, of course, it needs constant human intervention and engagement to make sure that the data is accurate and correct. Um, and here's the way that the device is sent. Um, so I like to talk about this as a kind of white modernist box that contains a black box of proprietary control. And when um, I received this, uh, this model, actually the marketing team sent out an email saying that they had deliberately redesigned their packaging to look like a high tech Apple device or other kind of, um, kind of Silicon Valley product uh, rather than a medical uh, device. Um, and here you can see what's in the box. This is basically the the transmitter has the G on it, then there's the charger for the transmitter, and then there's the insertion device. So you, um, on a weekly basis, insert a new sensor into your body um, and then um, calibrate it throughout the week so that it, it stays uh, close to, to accurate. And this is the Guardian 3 sensor uh, that you can see attached um, to the transmitter there. Um, so now I'll just walk you through some of the data uh, for the month in July 2019 when I uh, carefully transcribed that data from, from the device and, and sort of tried to make sense of, of the sort of experience of participating in the labor of AI systems. So you can see um, on the first day, I, I got one uh, alert. It was calibrate now, which means that you need to test your blood sugar with a meter and send that data to the device. This July 18th, uh, the 18th day, you can see there are a range of different alerts starting at 2.17 a.m., high sensor glucose, uh, blood glucose required, alert on low, calibrate now, sensor connected, sensor warm up, calibrate now, BG required, and here on July 27th, you can see that there were also quite a lot of, of alerts and alarms. And in particular, um, when I sort of, at the end of the month, when I finished transcribing, what I realized is that there were some days when I was getting more than one alert per hour, um, often you know, throughout the night or in the middle of the night. Um, and here you can see a sense of that, but there's, uh, such a wide variety of different kinds of alerts. Um, so these alerts become the kind of lingua franca of human machine communication in this case. Um, and here you can see the August 1st, another uh, series of alerts and alarms. Okay. Um, one of the things that happens, of course, is because of the frequency of alerts and alarms, um, one might decide to turn off the auto mode. So here you can see um, that there are some gaps and it says exit reason details. And this is the reason uh, auto mode disabled by user. So for example, if someone decides or I decided that, you know, I just couldn't bear to, you know, wake up in the middle of the night, I might turn off auto mode. So ironically, while the company's goal is to get more and more data about you, um, they end up getting less and you end up getting less because you turn off that feature over the night. And I had a, a conversation with one of my health providers who said that, you know, maybe if I wasn't gonna use it, then maybe this just device is just not for me. So this sort of punitive or kind of scolding of, of the user for not 
complying and not using the device. My goal is for patients to use that device um, about 80% of the time to be in auto mode is the goal, like 80 to 90% ideally. Um, and you can see there are some other reasons for the, the auto mode exit. Sometimes it might exit auto mode because you have too high of a, a blood sugar for over one hour. Sometimes um, you have um, the sensor algorithm you know, under red. So the BG was required to continue in auto mode. And if you don't put in a new BG, um, then it exits auto mode. Um, another reason for this is a, a lack of calibration. So for example, when for some reason, the sensor just doesn't calibrate correctly. So it says BG not received, no calibration occurred. And it will ask you to do it again 15 minutes later. Um, and then sensor updating. So auto mode exit due to the sensor needing to update. So these are kind of the various reasons that you can see that people uh, might fall out of auto mode, um, just to give you a kind of better understanding of that. Um, so this, this problem of alert fatigue is very well known in the healthcare area and in the aviation industry, uh, it's a very sharp contrast to healthcare because cockpit technology is rigorously designed to provide only highly consequential alerts to pilots, minimizing the minor alerts in order to allow pilots to maintain situational awareness. Um, but unfortunately in the healthcare and technology design, this um, human factors approach has been lacking. Um, and so it's very well known that actually doctors face incredible problems with alerts and alarms. And that means that they start to ignore them and they put, they may even put their patients at risk. Um, so, you know, it's a known problem. Um, and of course the companies do argue that of course the next model might be better um, and that some of these problems might go away because they, as they refer to it as the algorithm in this particular model is on what they call a short leash and the future models will be on a longer leash, meaning that it doesn't require as much human labor in order to get it to work. So this leads me to kind of try to develop this notion of the disabled cyborg. Um, so for me, it's both the technology and myself that's disabled. And we tend to continually um, think about notions of technological perfection around technology, but I think we really need to rethink that and begin to develop more relational understandings um, that will take into consideration these um, failures or breakdowns um, or requirements uh, that in order to get the system to work, it requires a very complex uh, participation and um, sort of dance between the human and the machine. So thus we can't continually uh, treat the human and the machine as, as kind of binaries. We actually have to develop new understandings of what that relationship might look like. Um, so that's you know, one of the, the concepts that I'm developing you know, through this, this empirical example. So then I'm gonna kind of zoom back out again. Um, so there's lots of discussion, of course, about things like AI bias and fairness and explainability um, that some of these recent books have pointed towards. Um, and so that's led the human-centered design. Can you, oh, I have one slide. Uh, so, so some of the things that I'm alerted to are the ways in which AI systems are intimately entangled with human life. And some of the things I'm alarmed about is that disabled people continue to be experimental subjects for technological innovation. Oh, something funny is happening with the slide. It's not letting me advance it. Okay, there we go. So, you know, human-centered design and computing has, might, we might say as a basis, for the field, you know, has thought about a lot about the individual discrete human user, typically about in, you know, not uh, communities of users, but often individuals. 
um, typically not thinking about things like intersectional oppression or uh, race and disability, for example, has tended to treat users as subjects, although we, we do have, of course, of participatory design as a field um, and has often you know, treated the user as a, con as a consumer. And so the, the AI, the computing side discussions have now advocated for uh, human-centered AI as a potential solution to the biases and harms that algorithmic systems have um, put forth. And you know, my, my kind of response to that is that it's, it's really the wrong, uh, the wrong approach. <laughs> so for me, you know, given this, the instability of the categories and the ways in which often I'm not sure if I'm taking care of the device or the device is, talk, is taking care of me. So it's a much more relational understanding. And, and you know, to develop a kind of post-human subjectivity means that these categories may not make sense. So human-centered AI would suggest that it's enough to design AI systems around the current paradigms of human-centered design, which I think that, you know, for several decades now, there's been, you know, a lot of arguments about why those are actually harmful. And so this, this is, you know, a, a direction of the field that I actually really disagree with. And so for me, I'm really trying to argue for, you know, a more than human approach um, that would treat users maybe as participants or think about consumers as repairers or take into consideration multiple um, identities, categories, or even collaborations and communities. Um, so again, if we go back to this idea of the more than human, um, we're struggling with you know, decades of research that's been focused on control, um, algorithmic systems that can predict and control. And that's, that's certainly the case in when we look at diabetes, because it's all about controlling blood sugar and keeping the individual within some kind of normative bounds, right? Of, of having the right, so to speak, blood sugar to be healthy. Um, and here we might say that, you know, there's a reason to want to engage with, or that if we think both about algorithmic systems and climate change, it creates a great deal of uncertainty. And so learning to design around and through indeterminacy and uncertainty um, as, a, as a goal makes sense. And here I link to some of the theories by Anna Singh, uh, Luciana Parisi, and, and Louisa Moore, um, where they talk about indeterminacy as ephemeral glitter, operators of potentialities, and ethical political beings. So these new kinds of ethics and new kinds of of politics that go along with some of these ideas. So with indeterminacy, we are in a perpetual state of what ifs. And if we think about the ways in which various disciplines approach, you know, research questions, we might say that science, you know, is often about what is, and the social sciences and humanities are often about why is. Design often refers to how might we and futures and speculation is about what if. Um, so can we develop a speculative praxis uh, building on something like Philip Agrae's critical technological praxis that integrates these critical theories such as those from critical disability studies with inventive exploration and make sense of things through making futures? So what are the kinds of what if questions I might ask with this project? What if I redesign my life or myself? What if I design new interfaces and fashions for this device? What if I use my data to create art objects? Um, what if disabled people play a bigger role in designing their own technologies? What if I design new kinds of social structures or communities um, or create new infrastructure? Um, this is just a, a small reference to Frida Kahlo because she's uh, you know, an artist and designer who had um, both polio as a child, but then was in a train accident and did design some of her own personal, um, so she, she painted on her body casts and she had boots of different uh, heights and 
this idea of both making herself up um, both as fashion and aesthetic, but also as imagination and speculation, you know, so, so that idea of, of making up uh, as well. So one of the things I've made, um, you know, as part of this broader project uh, is a collaboration with the designer Sky Cubba Cub, who runs a queer crip fashion um, company called Rebirth Garments. And so uh, working together, uh, I designed sort of a set, uh, a bathing suit that had some coverings for the insulin pump. And I question, you know, of course, like, what is my desire to cover up this device versus showing it um, or being, you know, proud of it or, but I think, you know, this was one way to just think about some of those questions. Like I, ha I was very anxious about the idea of going to the beach over the summer and wearing this medical device. And I was very uh, self-conscious. So this was one kind of intervention that allowed me to think through um, those, those questions. Um, and there are lots of people uh, with type one diabetes or even the parents or family members that are actually hacking old insulin pumps and actually creating uh, closed loop systems um, actually several years before some of the larger companies put those on the market. And so there's a you know, great, you know, experimentation happening um, that exposes a, a particular security flaw, flaw and uses it, you know, to create this kind of new, new system. Um, so I mentioned I had been involved with some of the communities of practice around type 1 diabetes, uh, including Twitter conversations and Facebook groups. And actually, there are over 20,000 users uh, specifically uh, for these models of insulin pumps where people share their own experiences. And there I often will share, you know, some of the ways in which I've learned to turn off certain uh, of the more um, irritating alerts and alarms. Um, after about two and a half years, I found that buried in one of the menus that there was a way to turn off the BG alert. Now it definitely doesn't uh, erase the majority of the problems I talked about, but that is one that it seemed kind of unnecessary, you know, from, from the, the sort of experience of, of the human trying to kind of sleep through the night, that particular alert wasn't, wasn't really that necessary, wasn't medically necessary or urgent. And so turning that one off does give people a little, have a little bit more agency over what they can, how they can, in, um, you know, work with the system. Um, and it's also, you know, a great source of social support and mutual aid for, you know, difficult and challenging situations. So people are constantly sharing their experiences with a, a wide range of things. And what I learned by participating in the groups is that people have so many more, you know, diverse kinds of problems than I could have ever imagined, of course, um, because, you know, it's, it is a, a disease or chronic illness or condition that um, is about 10% of the population worldwide, as far as I understand. Um, and so, so all of the different um, identities and bodies, you know, obviously interface very differently with the system. Um, so here's just an example of those two uh, support groups. So another group that has been doing really um, amazing work, obviously with, with disability is, is Sims and Bali. They have a coloring book that they're gonna be putting out, I think later this summer. Um, and they are an activist organization that, you know, where they um, are interested in an unashamed claim to beauty in the face of invisibility is their, um, is their slogan. So just to, to kind of close, um, thinking about, you know, what is relational thinking and the sort of these notions about the more than human and how we might work with these new design materials such as the self. Um, I think it really advocates for the centering of, of one's positionality and the acknowledgement of who we are as we participate in socio-technical systems thinking about the instability of categories and the ways that they're co-constructed through our use of these devices um, or technologies, um, new understandings of what it might mean to correctly 
uh, identify what kinds of harms are occurring and how we might take responsibility for working towards uh, a more just um, and equitable relationship with technology. Um, and uh, this idea of senti pensar is cited in Arturo Escobar's work um, from Latin American anthropology around thinking and feeling. So those are some of the things I think we can take away from, from this approach. Um, so particularly, you know, what does it mean to make these critical futures? It means to, to be explicit, to acknowledge that everyone has partial knowledge, um, to move away from thinking of technologies as tools and thinking of, of humans and technologies as participating together in cultures, um, to move away from the instrumental and towards relational, and then to move away from notions of use towards notions of, of living with and what that might really mean. So, you know, lastly, I'll just say, you know, my kind of punchline is, you know, for now I'd settle for an AI system that sleeps through the night, but I'm really interested to talk with you all and hear your questions about, you know, how this resonates with you and what you're thinking about in terms of ways forward in the field of human computer interaction as it intersects with these questions around, um, around, you know, uh, non-normative um, bodies and, and critical disability, for example. So thank you so much and um, looking forward to the discussion. And just thanks to all my uh, collaborators, um, in particular, Sky Kubakub, whose uh, fashion I showed today. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I spoke so much more slowly than I usually do. So it was like, it was really an interesting experience for me too, to still try to be more aware of just how quickly I'm, I'm speaking. So thank you. I totally feel you. I'm gonna stop recording now. <laughs>